am Debbie Schatzkes, and I'm going to present a brief case. Um, it's highlighting head and neck spaces, and it's part of the IDKD refresher series based on its workshop of diseases of the brain, head and neck, and spine. I'm professor of radiology and otolaryngology and the director of head and neck imaging at Lenox Hill Hospital, which is part of the Northwell Health System uh, in New York, USA. So the patient is a 53-year-old man with a mandibular lesion that was discovered on a dental x-ray. He has no significant past medical history, no symptomatology in the head and neck, and he was sent for a neck CT for further assessment of the mandibular lesion. So he underwent neck CT with IV contrast, and I'm not gonna show you his mandibular lesion, which turned out to be a focus of cementoosseous dysplasia, but I am going to point out uh, a incidentally discovered lesion on that neck CT. So we have uh, axial and coronal images, and we can see that there is some asymmetry on the right side, uh, and there is a lobular uh, low density mass uh, lateral to the nasopharynx on the axial and on the coronal images. So the patient was sent for an MRI for further characterization. So he underwent MRI with and without contrast and we can see on the coronal T1 series without contrast that there is, again, a lobular, well-demarcated mass lateral to the nasopharyngeal airway. On the contrast-enhanced uh, image, we can see that it does show some heterogeneous contrast enhancement. And on an axial stir image, we can again see this very lobular mass that shows very, very bright T2 signal intensity. In fact, the T2 signal intensity is pretty much identical to CSF surrounding the upper spinal cord. Additional images from this MRI um, are the axial DWI image uh, and the ADC image. And we can see on the DWI image that the lesion does not show um, much diffusion restriction. In fact, it's very similar to the cerebellar hemispheres that we see more posteriorly. But on the ADC map, it is very bright, kind of light bulb bright. In fact, so much brighter than the cerebellar uh, hemispheres that it almost again looks like CSF. So let's talk first about where the mass is. And this is a diagram from Amersys that shows some of the suprahyoid neck spaces. So we can see the very large masticator space containing the muscles of mastication uh, coated in purple. Behind it, we can see the parotid space, basically uh, consisting of the parotid gland. Medial to that in red, we can see the carotid space. And as we go further medially, the pharyngeal mucosal space with its retropharyngeal space more posteriorly. But I want you to focus on the parapharyngeal space, which is marked in dark purple. And you can see that that lies lateral to the pharyngeal mucosal space. If we look at a CT image, the parapharyngeal spaces are triangular shaped, fat containing spaces lateral to the pharynx. We can see uh, muscles of mastication, the uh, pterygoid muscle anterior to it, and then the parotid gland, the parotid space, posterior lateral to it. So if we go back to our image, we can see that this lesion um, is actually lying in the parapharyngeal space. Um, it is lying lateral to that nasopharyngeal mucosal space, medial to the parotid gland and behind the medial pterygoid muscle. So we're gonna place this mass in the suprahyoid neck and the right parapharyngeal space, abbreviated as PPS. Now we can talk about what the mass is. And when one uses the spaces approach to head and neck imaging, what it does is allow you first to put a lesion in the space then think about what that space contains and generate a space-specific differential diagnosis. 
So the contents of the parapharyngeal space are really pretty simple. It's primarily composed of fat. There are some minor salivary glands in it and a few small unnamed nerve branches. There's some controversy about whether you can find lymph nodes in the parapharyngeal space, but that is quite rare and we really don't consider lymphadenopathy in the differential for a parapharyngeal space mass. It turns out that primary lesions of the parapharyngeal space are actually quite rare, with salivary lesions far outnumbering those uh, composed of mesenchymal elements, including fat and nerves. But most parapharyngeal space pathology, in fact, comes from those adjacent spaces, the pharyngeal mucosal space medially, the parotid space posterolaterally, uh, and the masticator space um, anterolaterally, to name a few. So let's go back to our mass. We placed it in that right parapharyngeal space. We noted that it was lobular and very well demarcated, so without aggressive or infiltrative features. And it was very, very bright on T2 weighted imaging. Again, we can see that axial stir image on the upper left and very, very bright on the ADC image on the far right. So those are two kind of interesting and distinguishing features. So this mass turns out to be a benign mixed tumor, also known as pleomorphic adenoma. This is a benign salivary neoplasm arising from salivary glands, both major, such as the parotid uh, and submandibular gland, but also from minor salivary glands, such as those that live in that parapharyngeal space. It is, in fact, the most common parapharyngeal space and parotid mass. The contrast enhancement is not that helpful in characterizing this lesion. It's variable, often patchy, um, and tends to increase with delayed imaging. But what really distinguishes this lesion on MR imaging is that it is, again, super bright on T2 and very bright on ADC. In fact, it looks kind of like a light bulb on those two sequences. And those are clearly the most useful sequences in identifying a benign mixed tumor. What is the differential diagnosis for lesions of the parapharyngeal space? Well, other salivary tumors, including malignant, and we can see on the bottom left image, uh, a malignant salivary neoplasm adenoid cystic carcinoma of the right parapharyngeal space. Lipomas and liposarcomas uh, can occur. Remember, the primary contents of the parapharyngeal space is fat, and the middle image lent me by Dave Usum shows a parapharyngeal space lipoma. Uh, and then other mesenchymal tumors such as neurofibromas arising from those small unnamed nerves in the parapharyngeal space. And the image on the right shows a plexiform neurofibroma, a beautiful case lent to me by Dr. Michelle Michael from the Medical College of Wisconsin. But again, remember that most parapharyngeal space lesions arise from neighboring spaces, so we do have to think about lesions arising from the masticator space, the parotid space, the carotid space, or the pharyngeal mucosal space, the nasopharynx um, or oropharynx. It turns out you can use the pattern of displacement of the parapharyngeal space fat to help localize lesions. So if we look at the upper left image, this is another parapharyngeal space benign mixed tumor. And if we look carefully, we can see that there is a thin stripe of T1 bright fat signal completely surrounding the mass, and that places it primarily in the parapharyngeal space. But if we look at the middle image, this is an oncocytoma, another benign salivary tumor, and it is arising from the deep lobe of the parotid gland. And we can see that the parotid parapharyngeal space fat, marked by the arrow, is being displaced medially by this parotid space tumor. And then finally, the image on the right, which is a carotid space schwannoma, is displacing the parapharyngeal space fat again, marked with the red arrow and um, T1 bright, anteriorly placing it uh, in the posteriorly located carotid space. 
I'm going to finish off by providing you a few excellent references on the parapharyngeal space and the imaging evaluation of the suprahyoid neck and hopefully you can look at those at your leisure. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, please stay tuned for more uh, refresher course uh, cases from the IDKD. I hope to see you uh, all in person at the next IDKD uh, workshop. Thanks again.